putting principles in the um, in the position of like, hey, can't have both. Mm. Both are really important, but what do you care about more, librarian or like parent duty of an advocate? Like, you put Welcome to Talk Tuesday, a webinar series where we explore what it takes to kickstart new projects, launch new products, and create the right conditions for team success. I'm Eric Gorman, founder of Wiley, an agency that helps teams innovate faster with less risk through our sprint workshops and training. We help teams get aligned, eliminate unproductive meetings, and make rapid progress using our interactive, repeatable sprint workshops. Scale up with our training at wearewiley.com. And now to our guest. It's now my great pleasure to introduce my special guest and friend, Greg Schirmbeck, founder and principal of Shroom Co. LLC and founder of Shroom Co. Foundation. Welcome, Greg. Thanks, bud. It's a pleasure to have you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. It's fun to catch up. So I can do it. Yeah, cool. So you and I have known each other for several years. Uh, I've watched you and your company take off over the years. It's been exciting to kind of watch you be so successful. Um, we'll talk more about that whole world and your company. Right. But um, I just want to brag on you a little bit. You're super cool, <laughs> laid back, one of the most laid back people I know. Very funny, big kind of heart, which shows up in the work you do. Nice. So it's a, it's a real privilege to have you here. You gonna tell that last little trigger twenty? Yeah, so I like to do it on people and make them feel embarrassed and, and, <laughs> that was nice. and fuzzy if you line at the front end. Say that. I'll, <laughs> I'll, take it, I'll take it from the back. Thank you. <laughs> Give me that one for free. Yeah, of course. All nice. right. So talk to us about like when well first let's tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. What do you want to know? Um, where are you from? <laughs> like I, I like to know a little bit like on a personal side and then yeah. we can go professional, but sure. I'll let you take that where you want to go. Yeah, I'll start uh, 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 I'll start early. Um, I was born on a cold day in February of 20th. Uh, I grew up, well, I was actually born in Jacksonville, North Carolina. So I grew up, I grew up like two years on the Marine base. Uh, my, my dad was stationed there. Uh, he was in the Marines and went to Okinawa, Japan for a few years and went to some other places. So born in North Carolina, which when it's relevant, I can make a joke about being from the South and it's not relevant. <laughs> I tell people I grew up in Ohio, which is true. Um, so I lived in Ohio until uh, sophomore year of college, went to kind of traditional public schools, which I think is important for maybe later in the story, which we'll talk about. Um, have two great parents, two younger brothers that are twins, um, played sports my whole life growing up. And then graduated from high school, was fortunate to get into college and play football in college for four years. So that takes us to 2008, and then and I came to Charlotte in, in 2008 and started kind of my professional internment now here. So let's go there. Talk about your professional journey. Like, when did you even get into the education field? So, uh, yeah, <clears throat> when the financial crisis happened when we were graduating college in 2008. <laughs> um, I would say uh, it actually started my junior year in college. And so um, I did an off-campus program in Philadelphia called Philadelphia Center. And so instead of going to Spain or Italy, Italy like some some people, I got to go to Philadelphia. That's, that's my, <laughs> that was my summer abroad. It's like the Spain of America. Yeah, it's like, it's like, it's like <laughs> the Spain of the East Coast. Uh, the exact same. Um, but Philadelphia was great. I did the uh, Philadelphia Center. And then, so essentially did like a 30 hour a week internship at a real estate company um, that was focused on affordable housing in Philly. And then took a, um, like a 10 hour a month, 10, uh, yeah, 10 hour a month course called urban education. And so I majored in urban planning in college. And so both of those are kind of really like obvious kind of paths to take in Philly. I did not know that. Yeah. That was my master's degree. Was it? Urban planning. Yeah. Crazy. Found out I didn't have the patience for it and then chose for <laughs> education, which is like, you know. Yeah, everybody has a lot of patience. <laughs> right. So, uh, so urban planning major, Philadelphia, I uh, learned about Teach for America, learned about some of like, uh, the inner workings of how schools are funded, both in Philadelphia, but also public schools in general, right? You got to see that firsthand and met with a lot of really key players, I think, in the Philadelphia education system and teachers and students. Then at that time, I was like, you know, in college, I was the first person in my family to go to college, and then calling my parents back home, being like, do you guys know how schools are funded? Like, do you know it's based on, you know, taxes? And do you know, like, the school we went to was maybe less funded at a lesser level because of, like, on neighborhood and where we grew up and that sort of stuff. And so that connected to, I think, how I grew up with, you know, a lot of my um, family members had a strong military background. And so I still very much believe that, like, America was the greatest country on earth, but also at the same time wrestling with, I think, some of the inequities we all know would be true in America. And so having that background, plus kind of stumbling upon and educating myself more about how schools were funded back in 2006, uh, 
long way of saying that that should begin my journey into education to try to do something about it. You touched on Teach for America. That's an obviously prestigious um, organization and well-known, at least to me. I, I think it's very well-known. Um, what was that experience like? It was great. I think um, if it wasn't for Teach for America, we can get in probably to education. I, I was an urban planning major, so it wasn't a traditional path towards education. I think when the organization Teach for America started, they saw an opportunity and need to kind of solve the teacher crisis back in the late 80s, early 90s. And the organization's evolved since then. And it's certainly not kind of a perfect organization by any means, but I think in terms of the ability to innovate, in terms of the ability to take risks, to get non-traditional teachers into the education system was obviously a, a wild bet they made in the early 90s and the organization was continuing to grow. Um, but then once I got here, I mean, my experience at West Charlotte was incredible. So it's a, you know, Teach for America is a two year commitment. I stayed for a third year. I coached football and did some other work at West Charlotte High School where I taught, so I taught high school science. Um, and being able to learn from my students, being able to learn from other educators in the building, being able to, to, to be a teacher, being able to work with families, all of it was in, incredibly meaningful and important. Um, and I just hoped I helped the kids and the families as much as, as much as they helped me. So continue the journey then from that initial start of Teach for America with where did your career kind of take you guys? Yeah, so I really love teaching and the experience of working with families and communities and schools uh, at West Charlotte. Um, didn't love what I learned to be like the bureaucratic nature of any large school district. Mm -hmm. um, so I was three years in, kind of looking about maybe what was going to happen, but still wanted to stay in education. Had an opportunity to help go open a charter school in Nashville, Tennessee, in an under-resourced area in Nashville. And then so I went to really like the idea of both like merging education and entrepreneurship and was intrigued by just like the charter school model, which I didn't know much about in 2008 to 11 when I was here. And then so yeah, I took, took the leap to go to Nashville to work with an incredible founding team and open, open a charter school from scratch. You were young. I mean, that's pretty incredible opportunity and probably pretty scary, I would yeah. imagine. <laughs> all, all the above. Yeah, yeah. all the above. Um, yeah, I was... 24, 25. So the founding team of students, luckily we had a, a strong head of school or like a you know, founder of the school and then helped hire the rest of the team. Um, and went through a lot of trainings, both like individually and collectively as a team and felt really strong. We had been models to look at around the country around what constitutes a high performing school, both in supporting families and supporting the students with the scholars we were, we were serving. And so yeah, it was certainly scary. We're certainly trying to figure it out, um, but had a good sense of like what we needed to do and how to best serve the, the school or the, the students and the families that we aspire to serve in North Nashville. Awesome. Okay, keep the keep the, the, the path going. Yeah. Um, um, so uh, yeah, I was lucky to stay and help grow Nashville Prep for three years. Uh, after the, the first year, um, went back to get my graduate degree in leadership and organizational performance. And so it was kind of the a dual degree between the education and the business schools. Again, really interested in kind of the merger of both of those. Um, and then, yeah, a lot of things kind of happened. That was an interesting fork in the road. So that takes us to like 2014. I was graduating the grad school program. Um, the school we were growing, National Prep, had grown for three years. That school was merging with another charter management organization to kind of grow and expand both in Tennessee and, and actually in Mississippi as well. They actually went on to open the first ever charter school in the state of Mississippi, which is yeah, kind of really cool and awesome. I think that school is still really successful. Um, and so I was kind of like a little bit of a crossroads around like, you know, staying with this organization, you know, build, kind of maybe taking a more traditional path um, through kind of like jobs that were presented to us after grad school. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then kind of like a mixture of both of those things. So I think I mean, to be really honest, like my, you know, going back to my parents, my dad kind of was working for a company for a long time that laid off kind of out of nowhere. And Washington kind of struggled through that in the midst of me trying to figure out my next career move was tough. And um, that the, the kind of charter organization in Nashville that was merging, um, there was like a position I thought I was going to take, new leadership came in, and they didn't think I was going to take it, and so it didn't really work out. And so I was in a little bit of a crossroads there. And then like the third thing is, I th you know, we had hired kind of consulting firms um, when I was in that kind of space at the charter school and also did some uh, consulting work or like education in the grad school side. And consulting originally really felt kind of slimy to me because my experience was with bad with a lot of like, traditional consultants we met. And so in my own experience, they kind of told us what we knew we needed to do, but didn't actually help us do anything. Mm -hmm. And so the lack of kind of the capacity and support 
while already inside of a lean organization after we paid them and sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars felt really frustrating. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of like all those kind of personal and professional experiences combined. The day after graduation, um, I know I kind of just said, "Forget," and I was going to try to build an organization that aspired to do a bit less kind of traditional consulting and a bit more implementation and strategy, focus on solutions in kind of the social impact space. It's gotten a lot better since 2014, but the initial thought was that if we could get one client, we could do a good job and get more. Um, so, so that was the start of it. Enter Shrimp Co. Yeah. Okay, so talk, keep going. And uh, what we kind of talked about what led you to start Shrimp Co., those formative experience that you're frustration with the traditional consulting and educational yeah. space. How did you go about getting that first client? Um, who was it and how'd that feel? Yeah, I went about it. Slowly, unfortunately, because it, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> so hard. And so at that point, I was 27, 28, trying to be like, I'm going to start a consulting firm. And people are like, you're dumb. Like, what, what, what are you going to consult, right? The, the definition of consulting is giving advice. And so the, the thought of, you know, frankly, me or my nanny 27 year old being like, I'm going to give you advice. is kind of wild and not the best business plan, right? Um, so I think I tried to make it very clear with like my personal and professional network, right? I was in this we, I slash the future we, uh, what, you know, we were not aspiring to kind of be a traditional consulting firm to kind of give advice or kind of bestow knowledge or wisdom upon the, um, it was really focused on at that point, project management in the after school space, which is when I had a lot of experience in at that point and kind of kid through 12 education. So I knew we could manage projects. I knew we could do it in a way that would be uh, focused on implementation and be semi-fun and semi-affordable at that point because we would have taken any business on in the first uh, 12 months of, of work. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, you know, a lot of it was just like initial, I think, friends and family outreach. Um, was fortunate to land kind of our first partnership with an organization in Charlotte called Council for Children's Rights, and I was still in Nashville at that time. Mm -hmm. And so, was supposed to fly back one night, flight got canceled. Interview was like, it's like a kind of crazy interview story that maybe we all have. Interview was the next morning at 10 a.m. Flight was like at 8 p.m. Flight got canceled. I needed, yeah. I needed the job. So got my butt in a car, drove to Charlotte. Oh, wow. Uh, took a, you know, a few hour nap from <laughs> 4 to 7 a.m. and then made it to the interview by 7.45. Um, wow. And I ended up being the first contract that launched Shunko. Wow. That is a pretty neat story. Yeah. Um, I actually don't tell that story to much just because I forgot about it, but like, it's a true story. I was definitely stranded at the airport eating a Juga John sub and being like, what, like, what are the options here? Like, what's the world oh. forward path? <laughs> it was oh. get in the car and drive me short of Yeah, I mean, I, I yeah, about the scrappiness. Yep. You have to. Oh, yeah, I mean, there's no other options at yeah. that point. I didn't want to risk trying to reschedule it and, you know, who knows, it was like, well, so we were doing that day or anything else. And so it right, right. felt like an opportunity that, uh, that yeah, I couldn't miss. Man, okay. So what have, I mean, you're, you're seven employees strong now. You've grown the business, like, as you think back to that very first client to now, like, what are some of the twists and turns and some of the lessons learned along the way? Yeah, so many. Depends how long we want to chat for. Um, I get time. I think the nature of what we do is stay the same, right? We're, we're, we continue to be really focused on implementation results. And so we, we only take on projects where we think we can capture real results for partners, let's say, within like six to eight month engagement. And so whether that's raising money, building a new earned revenue model for a growing nonprofit, um, implementing a new family empowerment strategy at schools, we're extremely focused and so our model we hit the ground and pretty fast. So that's really never changed, although we've just gotten better and smarter. I think, fortunately, what we've been able to do is carve out a piece of them, hopefully in the market where I think respectfully to anybody watching this or anybody in the room, uh, not a lot of people like traditional consultants. I think for whatever experiences they have, and we have some head shaking in the room behind the <laughs> camera here. Um, and so I think it's us positioning ourselves that yes, we're technically like an outside party. We're intentional about not using the, the C word, the consulting word yeah. around us, um, but really focus on implementation. And so I think that we can continue to carve out that niche and get good results for our partners would be in a good spot. I think what's changed is fortunately we've grown, as you've said, and so now it's much more than just me, which is wonderful. Um, we continue to be uh, squarely focused in kind of the social impact space, and to us that's uh, within schools, uh, growing into the workforce development space, uh, growing into some kind of general strategic implementation for all the social impact space. 
uh, doing work in the CSR space of corporate social responsibility. So helping kind of growing corporations or corporate foundations better give and better implement their philanthropic strategies. Um, and actually pretty soon we'll kind of like this could be the first time, but formally announcing growth into the child care space um, and helping with kind of a, a big dearth in need in terms of child care coordination programming. I see you shaking your head, so you fucking yeah. know. Um, you know, educators in the child care space. And so been fortunate to, to stand up some pretty intriguing partnerships that we feel like have some pretty innovative solutions that um, can be scaled both in North Carolina and, and likely across the country. You mentioned like the different verticals that you're in. Are, are there... Is there a kind of common thread of a certain type of ideal client as you look across those, or does it depend on who you're serving or what type of offering you're providing? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think outside of, you know, selfishly budget and whatnot, I think it's a lot of it's a mindset, right? And so clients have to have the right mindsets for us around equity, around anti-racism, around belief from the clients and the systems we're trying to change together. So even mindset's always really important that we're um, kind of searching for, either when we have initial conversations or just doing some good old-fashioned business development. Um, I think outside the mindset, it's the willingness to uh, kind of do the work either together or us or themselves. And so since we're not kind of a traditional consulting firm, we're often pushing clients to kind of hit the ground running pretty quickly. But we have to do it in a safe space, respectful to them and their clients and their constituents. Um, but whether we're setting up kind of strategic test or helping like build a build a market strategy in three months. They not only have to have the right mindset, they gotta be willing to kind of act on that mindset to see if we can kind of capture real data along the way to push the organization forward. Um, so th those are often kind of the two biggest facets we're looking for in, um, kind of the, in kind of the characteristics of the clients that allow us to work well with them and capture really the best kind of outcomes we can with them and for them and for the clients they're serving. So it's about the mindset, but they, ideally they have a capability, right? They can actually execute with your help and guidance. Yeah, yeah it's a capability and willingness, right? And so mm -hmm. um, willingness to, like I said, try new things, uh, to not just kind of wait until it's in, you know, a formal 60-page PowerPoint or 3DF, but to kind of get enough data early on, get their green light. We're always doing stuff that is in accordance with them and getting green light before them so we're not getting a little lightly without them. Mm -hmm. See what they do there? And see what you got. Uh, that was nice. Traumatic boss. Uh, yeah, it's not good. Um, but we also want to make sure like they're cool with it before we're trying anything. Mm -hmm. uh, but then in a safe space, trying to get to make sure whatever we're kind of putting in a formal recommendation state or something else, we have real data to know as long as we keep going down the path we're like trying to shine the light on for them, um, that we'll continue to be in a good spot. They'll continue to achieve some real benchmarks towards a larger goal. Kind of de-risking. Yeah. Because it's a fraught environment to work in. And have you noticed as things have sort of ratcheted up with all the tension in the, in the field, all the yeah. politics and the cultural wars that have really, st I mean, it's probably already been, always been educated for some degree, but it feels like it's really amped up now. Has that affected, how has that affected your work? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I, I, I don't know, right? It's, um, it changes daily and weekly with new presidential elections and campaigns being announced. It changes with mm -hmm. different funding strategies. It changes with COVID and then COVID dollars getting put into the economy. And so I think what we know is that it's always going to change. Um, it's kind of our job to find the organizations and the leaders that are willing to kind of partner with us and vice versa. And that amongst the change, we find the people, the organizations that want to kind of push the systems in the right direction. And then we continue to keep our community close and build our community alongside with them. Um, Outside of all the change that's going to happen either way, we can continue to have strong partnerships um, and build solutions for the clients that we have the pleasure of working with. What are some like, I mean, politics, I'm sure is a big one, but like, both want to talk about some of the big hurdles that you see that are maybe either keep you up at night or you're, you know, you're just always kind of how to navigate, but I also want to talk about the positives too, which are so about is kind of balance that out, but. Talk to us about that. The non-positives? Yeah. Yeah, non -positives. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, let me try to be semi-smart here. Uh, I mean, I think the funding or the lack thereof is a consistent hurdle we hear from schools, from child care providers, from nonprofits, from a lot of organizations that we support, both like the lack of funding and lack of capacity, right? And so oftentimes in public schools, not so much in nonprofits, but sometimes but often just in public schools in general, at least in North Carolina, the lack of funding or the lack of like 
really good fiscal management, either at the state, the local, or city level, is often a determinant on do we have enough teachers to teach kids, or is one teacher teaching 50 kids and are all 50 kids on a variety of reading levels that makes it virtually impossible for that teacher to be successful, right? So the funding and the lack of capacity because of said funding often puts what I would argue as schools and one of the most important institutions in our mm. in our free world um, in jeopardy because they don't have the tools and the resources to then serve the future leaders of, of our country or of our world, right? So I think those two things often come um, come up oftentimes within that. Uh, we talk about the capacity piece, which is tied to funding. I think many organizations don't have, because of the funding, the right kind of leadership or just the right amount of leadership. You know, case in point, n very few schools across North Carolina have what we'd call like a family engagement or parent advocate. So sometimes it's like an optional uh, position within schools. And if they can't afford it or they chose like hire a librarian instead of like just putting principals in the um, in the position of like, hey, can't have both. Mm. Both are really important, but what do you care about more? Librarian or like parent engagement advocate? Mm. Like you put, you know, any, any leader in a really tough spot. So because of that, then that falls onto the head of an assistant principal. It's like, hey, assistant principal, you have to do behavior, you have to do curriculum, you have to do team culture, you have to do everything else in the building, and also like you have to try to engage 600 families once a month. So it just took a lot, right? And so. Without both like funding and capacity, I think it's going to continue to be a hurdle, whether it's in um, the social impact space or just like K-12 schools specifically. And then what are some things that you're really excited about that are in the horizon or that you see maybe in the, in the space of education? Yeah. Well, I think given the you know struggles of funding in North Carolina, um, unfortunately, there is can't keep going too much lower. I think that regardless of the data you look at, we're usually in you know, one of the top five to eight lowest funded states per pupil in the country. And so although that's a bummer, uh, ideally we go up either with upcoming elections, change in cycles or change in mindsets and kind of current leadership locally or politically. And based upon when this airs, there'll be some important elections coming up uh, for everybody uh, in November of 24, right? Both locally and across the country. Um, I think outside of funding, we every like our clients are incredible, right? There are humans and leaders that care deeply about solving big challenges that are in ecosystems that they know maybe don't have enough funding or the right support they can. But I think they're so hopeful and optimistic about the work that can happen and needs to happen. Being able to work with them side by side on a daily basis to solve really challenging problems is like incredible and something that that certainly keeps me or keeps me going and gets me excited to wake up in the morning. And I'd say too, like the more work we're able to do in the space, the more hopeful I am to like increase collaboration and coordination. I think as we're working with large school districts and large funders and large political entities, um, there's not often, which kind of sounds bad, I'm not sure if this is necessarily a business model, but there's not often like a coordination of systems. Mm -hmm. And because of not a coordination of systems, the systems usually just do what systems can do, which based upon your skin color and your gender and how much money you have in the bank account may not be working the way you should. It may not be working the way to benefit the entire community or the entire country. And so that leads to hope and optimism from us that whether we're like directly in this space, hopefully doing more than just coordination, but really helping align and close gaps and align funding systems, align actions, that when those kind of gaps can be called out and solved for, um, then the system can operate more efficiently and more equitably for everybody. I love that. I mean, that, that's definitely a pattern that I see in the work that I do too. Um, you've already shared a few of these, but I'm curious, are there some things that are maybe like shocking things that are maybe in plain sight of, uh, in, in the field of education and maybe people, as you talk about this with different folks from yeah. all of our stakeholders that, that just like really like surprise people about education? The stuff we've learned around or just like maybe what the general public doesn't know about schools? These are one maybe things that you've learned because of your unique position, but also sure, just spending time in this field for so long. Um, I don't know if it's a learning, but I'll call an audible and say, so I, I, we always encourage people as much as they can and as much as they kind of feel stronger about any sort of position, whether it's like family engagement or school curriculum or something else to actually spend time in the school. I think what we found, and this is 
no shade to anybody listening or <laughs> that have friends and family in their network, but there's often a lot of pontificating or um, advocating for things that simply aren't true. And then I think if we ask a question, like totally understand your point, thank you for sharing. When's the last time you've been in public school? Oof. And not to be derogatory, but just to be very clear about recent data. And then if it's one week ago, we can talk about that. If it's one year ago, we can talk about that. If it's seven years ago, we can talk about it, but we're gonna have some more follow-up questions. So it's like, you know, whether it's a mindset issue, whether it's like a certain piece of curriculum they're advocating for or against, or whether it's like operationally, I think just getting into a school, whether it's just observing, being supportive or something else, um, would ideally allow kind of all humans that care about this space and that think about it and advocate for and advocate against it to really get a sense of like what's actually happening. And once we start with real data, real mindsets and real actions, we can begin to map out a backwards plan, real solutions. Uh, but if we're not talking about real stuff, uh, it's really hard to talk about and implement real solutions if we're not talking about things that are actually happening on a day-to-day -day basis. Interesting. And so, I don't know if that's too basic no, uh, I... for the question, but I think getting really clear on data, and I think the other thing I'd add, Eric, is like, centering data. And so a lot of times, I think we all get in that with saying like, well, research shows X, Y, and Z. And it's like, what research are you studying? Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not a scholar by any means, but I think it's important if we actually know what research we're citing, what data we're talking about, and we're not talking about any data at all. I'm, I'm all for like qualitative stories and qualitative experiences, which we need. But I would, uh, I, I think one additional surprising thing is making sure we're not making policy decisions, funding decisions, other large scale decisions without either centering data at the beginning and or centering data or like benchmark goals at the end. Mm. Yeah, and at the other, if we can do both of those, you know, hopefully together, but if not, a little bit better each day, we can really begin to uh, make better, kind of better bets around implementation and results for the kids and the youth and on the social impact space that we serve. Passion is great. It's energy. We need passion to make changes, but at the same time, without the, the, the softening effects of the centering data that you spoke of, yeah. things can go awry. I think so, right? And, you know, we don't need to just be focused on third grade reading, right? Like, that's important. There's other quality things around, you know, nutrition and, and housing, of course, and all the services that we need to, to do well. Um, but if we're going to be serious about putting big money in, you know, we need both a benchmark data to begin with, as well as, like, kind of qualitative results at the same time, if we know and have a clear sense of, like, where we're going. It doesn't necessarily mean anything big or small is a failure if we don't hit a certain amount of benchmarks at least allows us to show progress and hopefully five, 10 years from now, the next new iteration or new initiative can pick up where we left off and kind of carry that along the way. You mentioned um, some of the future plans, growth opportunities you're pursuing yeah. with workforce development, childcare, huge need uh, in both of those areas. Um, is there anything else you can build upon in terms of the vision you have for Uncle? Yeah, I we're gonna keep getting clients and keep um, implementing, helping them implement solutions and results and keep keep making payroll. I think at a organizational level, um, we're kicking around a few ideas of how to either kind of productize some mm -hmm. of the work that we can do, which is mostly kind of time intensive client facing work, either in, in kind of traditional products and or um, digital products as well. And so we've, um, with some current clients that have been building, we think are some pretty unique and sophisticated kind of budgeting tools, both for day-to-day -day budgeting, but let's say like $50 million campaigns for large-scale initiatives across the system. So how do we kind of use tools and insights that, according to our clients, don't exist in the market and build those at a small scale, and then potentially um, offer those to other clients locally and across the country. Um, so I think continue to do a lot of the day-to-day -day work um, in kind of the four buckets we, we spoke about, but kind of added out some additional layers vertically to add some tools to help our clients when, when we're not there, or can't be there. It's interesting. I mean, I mentioned this earlier too, but you know, founder of Sherm Shur Co Foundation as well. Yep. Talk to us about that foundation and what it allows you to do. Yeah. On the LLC. Yeah, great. So that happened about two years ago. And so the kind of four buckets we had, a, a main one was family empowerment initiatives which started as a district chart collaboration and, and based upon me watching this, at least in Charlotte and in North Carolina, and districts and charter schools don't often talk, work together or share resources. Uh, but when we first started in 2016, we saw it as an initial opportunity for two schools that were less than a mile apart to come together and help launch a family empowerment initiative. Mm -hmm. So we started back in 2016, two schools, a charter 
district collaboration, focus on family empowerment this most recent year, as of three weeks ago, served 20 Title I organizations, both schools and nonprofits. A majority of those are in Charlotte, a few were in Durham, um, served those 20 organizations, about 18,000 families, and have essentially hosted 82 events to help support those families in uh, different empowerment indicators, mostly focused on financial literacy and workforce development opportunities. So that's kind of the work happening on a day-to-day -day basis. I think as the business owner, in governance-wise, realized as the family empowerment work was growing, uh, it was unique and different uh, for a lot of ways than kind of the three other pillars under the LLC. And so thinking about scale and sustainability, we decided to move the family empowerment bucket or work into its own separate legal 501c3. And so that work now lives under the Shermco Foundation. Um, that foundation has three full-time employees, a board member totally separate from the LLC that now runs that work, um, both for the sustainability and capacity of those team members and that side of the organization or that separate organization. And then the LSC, the strategy work, the workforce development work, the child care work, the CSR work, all lives under the LLC, which has its four separate employees. So long way of saying, um, did not aspire to start a nonprofit back in the day, although we've always been in the social impact space, mm -hmm. uh, but felt as that work was going to continue to grow and the resources we needed, uh, sustainably, sustainability-wise, it made sense to put that into its own separate organization. If it means to the same end. Yeah, correct, correct. That's cool. What are you curious about right now? What are you like, I'm exploring or interested in at the moment? Oh, great question. Um, I mean, honestly, I don't sleep very well, so I'm <laughs> curious about sleeping aids. Yeah. <laughs> Alone. that are legal and uh, are semi-healthy and so if somebody has any like sleeping remedies out there I, I thought about that last night at 2 a.m. Um, I think I'm training for the around the crown 10k and so if anybody has advice on how to learn faster as I get older besides sleeping more I'm open <laughs> into those suggestions um, and I think, you know, we're coming up on a, on back on the personal side, I, I think about our team a lot. And so I'm thinking about how we continue to develop our seven team members, both like to be better and serve our clients better, but how I can serve them better. I'm thinking a lot about in relation to that capacity. Like I have an incredible team that works really hard and um, always thinking about how we balance both like keeping clients happy and making sure I'm not putting too much ownership and responsibility on our team. And so in full transparency, I think you really deeply around maybe some small tweaks within our service model to make sure our team can continue to be as fresh as they can be so they can keep servicing our clients as well as they can. Fantastic. So open to any suggestions on those three areas. <laughs> um, leading and running probably faster. others. Yeah, sleep, running faster, uh, balancing team expectations and team support. Well, Greg, this has been a treat. How can people uh, keep up with you in the world with Shrunk Hub? Yeah, thanks. Uh, it's been awesome. Thanks for having me. Um, we're on most social media platforms at Shrunko, S-C-H-E-R-M-C-O. Um, yeah, we have podcasts. This work is pod, um, which if, if you're in a podcast, uh, feel free to check us out at podcast hosts and, and interviews leaders of color within the social impact space across the country. Um, so if you're interested in any of this stuff, uh, I, I was hopefully semi-smart about and the great leaders we get to work with. Um, and you're also in the podcast. You can... You can check us out there. I checked them out. I, I, I watched a couple in preparation yes. for today, <laughs> and I recommend them. Out. They're great. They're really good. Thank them. Well, great. Yeah, man. Your time. It was awesome. Well, it's your pleasure. Appreciate it. Your, your a gift to the Charlotte community and beyond those that you serve. So, it's gone. Thanks for making time. Good luck. All right. Thanks. See you guys next time. Bye-bye. I'm Jake Knapp, and I'm the creator of the Design Sprint Process. I'm the author of this book, Sprints, and I am here at the Wiley offices in Charlotte, North Carolina. This right here, if you were thinking about maybe doing a design sprint with Wiley, this is where you would be at this table, probably, unless you do it at your office, which is totally an option, but right here in this space with a whiteboard, with a bunch of paper and pens, basically they're gonna help you think through the problem, get it started and get a solution tested really rapidly. That's the whole idea with a design sprint.
I'd highly recommend if you're thinking about it that you do give Wiley a chance to your project. I've worked with these folks a couple times and they always exceed my expectations. I always do things a little bit better uh, than I could have imagined ahead of time. Also really nice. So don't tell them I told you that. I try to, you know, keep it cool, but they're super nice people. Anyway, best of luck to you and uh, try Sprint.